Welcome back to another episode of the podcast from the depths of darkness to the light of success. I am your host, Chris Swick. And on this podcast, we talk about mental health, addictions, suicide awareness, eating disorders, ADHD, and really anything, any, anything anyone's afraid to talk about at the end of the day. Doesn't matter what walk of life you come from. You're all welcome on my platform. You can check the podcast over on YouTube with the same name as the podcast from the depths of darkness to the latest success. Hit that subscribe button, turn on the notifications or head over to Spotify, Apple podcast, Google, wherever you listen to your podcast audio, you can find mine there as well. And hit me up over on Instagram at depths of dark side with no further ado. I'd love to introduce you. My next guest from the Virginia area of the USA, we got Carmen Garcia. We're going to deep dive into mental health, suicide awareness, and many other types of things on the show. But you want to take it away and let them know a little bit about them, but about yourself today, Carmen? Sure. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. My name is Carmen, and I am here living in the Virginia area. I have family from the U.S. and Spain. Bilingualism is big in my life, bicultural, and I... What else can I tell you? Very passionate about mental health. I saw some of your show on somebody else's Instagram once and was really intrigued by the conversation you all were having and how authentic it seemed. And that really attracted me to what you're creating over here. So I wanted to be part of that conversation and be able to offer whatever perspective I have, whether it's unique or not. I wanted to have the opportunity to share that and talk about some of this stuff. I am adamant about not enjoying small talk. (laughs) So this seems like almost the opposite of a small talk podcast, right? It's like you could say, and I'm I'm into it. Yeah. Thank you again for coming on the show today and taking the time of your day. What were you doing exactly a year ago that is different from today? A year ago, let's see, July 13th. I know it was like exactly on this day. I had a terrible bout with COVID last year, right before the vaccinations were out, actually. Um, I had gone to, this is an interesting story that just shows me the, the fragility of life in a way. I was due to get my first vaccine when they came out here in my area. I had a bit of a cold though, but I thought it would be fine. I went into the place where they were administering the uh, the vaccines And everyone kept letting me go. I told them, I was like, I think I have a bit of allergies or something. They're like, yeah, you're fine. You're fine. I passed through a bunch of different people. And eventually the nurse who was supposed to administer the shot was like, I don't think that you should do it. If you have any cold symptoms, go get yourself a COVID test. And lo and behold, I did have it. I got very sick, was in the hospital with double pneumonia for a while and was later told by my physician that like it was a blessing that I hadn't gotten the vaccine because you can have a terrible reaction. And some people who have gotten the vaccine when they were struggling with COVID, right, were actually died from that. So I was like, wow, that lady was my my angel, my like guardian angel in that instance for not giving me the shot. I don't know. That's what I think about in July, mid-July is that I finally got that vaccine after not being able to get it and having that weird situation happen. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're very passionate as well about mental health. Now, what makes you so passionate? What is mental health to you today? I think that for someone to truly be passionate about something and have the empathy and capacity to understand it, oftentimes it's something you have to deal, have struggled with personally. And although I didn't know it for most of my life, like I didn't really have the awareness that I struggled with mental health until I was about 19. Even though that's the case, I have had anxiety basically my entire life. I remember being a little kid and just having these these panic attacks and overthinking this hyperactive inner critic. A lot of the physical symptoms, I think you even commented a bit on this video that I had made of the some of the unsuspecting symptoms that you might see displayed in children that a lot of parents and teachers aren't always looking out for. I didn't know how to verbalize it. I had no way of putting words to my my emotions at the time. So that's something I'm very passionate about. In fact, it's what I'm getting my degree in right now is I'm working on a master's of education, specifically in social emotional learning. 
So this has to do with how school systems can implement that mental health aspect along with your physical health, your PE, to make health more of a holistic topic that's addressed in schools. And that has to do with things like learning how to verbalize your emotions and put names to them, how to be mindful, teaching mindfulness at a really young age, positive relationships, leadership skills, all that, all those good stuff. Um, can go into that more at some point if you're interested, but that's it's been something I've personally struggled with, especially in the past three years, more than anything, uh, in addition to the pandemic, just making every, I think, everyone's mental health significantly worse. Yeah, it's, I'm very happy to be pursuing it as my career as well because it has affected my life so much i love that it does need to be implemented more in schools but even up here in canada as well it's got to start from an earlier age just implementing mental health having those talks though but i don't believe in sugarcoating things either telling the kids the way it is have people actually tell stories that they've been through those types of those types of situations in their life they've walked the walk i don't believe in sugarcoating it you don't have to tell them all the deep dirty secrets of well, what you did what drugs you did or what you know the details have someone that's actually you know, been through it not just someone either that's you know ha and i'm not putting you down for going through with your degree but you've struggled with mental health yourself but not someone with a, just a piece of paper and a degree but it's never been through any of these situations in their life you know that's the thing that boggles my mind sometimes when i've struggled to find a good therapist to even too yeah. sometimes because lots of them they've never been through what i've been through i've finally found one that's been through some similar situations that i've been through we've had some good chat i haven't mm -hmm. started seeing him yet because he's shut him shut his office down for the summer and just enjoying the summer and that's okay because everyone's entitled to do that right but i truly believe that we mm -hmm. should be bringing more people in to have these chats with the kids yeah. on a level whatever grade level they're on as well i think there's a like level of respect there being able to not sugarcoat something and say hey like i care enough about you and i think we as people misunderstand like that kind of sugarcoating and trying to protect children as being in their best interest when in reality like you're saying it's good to be up front and prepare actually have children prepared for the struggles that come with life that are intrinsic. I think life intrinsically comes with a good deal of pain and a good deal of beauty as a result. But the two exist, the yin and yang, one without the other. And to not have, not be like selling the false perception that everything's supposed to be beautiful all the time, happiness, that's what you should expect. And then if you miss that mark at all, you start feeling like there's something wrong with you. I think that can be really problematic. So what was it? What events in your life that brought you to the point of trying to take your own life last year as well? Or is there a whole bunch of things that have snowballed to that day of that event? I feel like for a lot of people that, you know, I've talked to and my own experience, there's not often one event that like... Oh, an example, my, my boyfriend broke up with me. And so I tried killing myself the next day. So many like times it's just not as simple as that. It yeah. really is the accumulation of many of them being worn down. I think life wearing you down. And I have this tattoo here that it says resilience and it's a sunflower. And I got this a few years back hopefully is like a reminder and I I still love the tattoo but the word has begun to piss me off a little bit of resilient in the sense that god it's exhausting to be resilient all the time to go through those motions of despite what life throws at you you pick yourself up by the bootstraps and you keep on going that rhetoric yeah pisses me off a bit <laughs> even though I've tattooed it onto my arm so I would say, yeah, it really was a combination of having had an undiagnosed mental health disorder for so long, for my entire life. On top of that, having had intense trauma as a child that also really messed up my idea of myself and my world. It just trauma alters a child's brain in sometimes a very detrimental way that it takes a lot of work to go back and fix that and reestablish ideas. I 
it was just so I'd had surgery that was very difficult on me. The recovery process was rough. I was in the process of filing for retribution against my stepfather who had sexually abused me as a child. And that was bringing up a ton of memories and feelings that I just I probably start opening up old wounds, wounds that, that I had forgot to about and mm-hmm. you know, pushed down sort of thing. Yeah. Now we're not feeling those wounds, but were you burying those with drugs and alcohol per se at any points in time or like just trying to numb those feelings of yours or did you do that differently? Sure. sure. I think we all try to find some kind of outlet and that can be so different for everybody. But when you're feeling that high level of just pain and everyday discomfort, we you look for something. For me, it's been diff- different things depending on where I've been in life. When I was younger and wasn't using drugs or alcohol, it'd be relationships, really just toxic relationships that I'm learning so much about now in retrospect. I'm reading this book that I'm loving called Attached, and it's about different attachment styles and why certain people are attracted to others. And it's fascinating. I highly recommend it. So that's one part. And then later years in my college years, definitely drugs and alcohol were big. And I didn't understand why, because all of my like fellow students were participating in the same behavior. So it felt very normalized. I didn't think that there was an issue. I was in a sorority for a while. Like it was very much you drink till you black out and that's norm. And I didn't realize how harmful that was to myself, especially as someone who had just started taking antidepressants. It's tough and I do still take them and I do still drink. And I don't think there's any right or wrong way to... It's all so individual. It changes. It has to do with where you are in your life. But numbing is real. (laughs) It's very real. And I actually had a really insightful phone call yesterday with I'm starting a DBT group. I'm going to be it's for those who don't know DBT's dialectical behavior therapy. It's a type of therapy similar to CBT or ACT that deals with dialectics. So two things going on at the same time. There's different areas of it that are supposed to give you skills for your everyday life, things that you can apply. It's most often used for those who have things like anxiety, mostly borderline personality disorder, PTSD, like providing those skills. So I'm starting this group soon. I had an intake session with the leader yesterday. And for the first time ever, she really validated my like concerns that I have with my own substance use and use of sex and relationships. She was, I get it. Like you've been through a lot. You've dealt with mental illness since you were a kid. Like uh, why wouldn't you use something to numb it? And I've never had, I don't know. It was just one of those moments where I was like, whoa, what do you mean? Like I shouldn't be shaming myself for these behaviors? Shouldn't I be like beating myself up constantly for smoking pot? Isn't that bad? That was very much a belief that was in my family. Drugs are bad. They will kill you. Sex is bad. It will. You'll get a disease and die. So I just had these like core beliefs for a long ass time. And I felt very validated for the first time yesterday. And it was cool. It is nice when you feel validated though. And (laughs) You know, everything is going to be okay at some point in time. And it's okay just to keep saying that to yourself over and over too. Even my fiance, she just wants to hear that for everything's going to be okay. And it is. Uh You know what I mean? You got to, we're going to have hard days. We're going to have good days. And it's okay to have those days as well. Everyone. It's okay to have feelings. Who would have thought it? I don't know about you, but... Throughout my life, I have not thought that feelings were okay. Like the bad, the negative ones, the difficult ones. No feelings are now. Do you think that was because that was what sort of was instilled in you when you were younger, like growing up with family and stuff like that? I think that there's the level of toxic positivity that's ingrained in our culture and that can also be taught by whoever it is we're growing up with, where just push those negative feelings away, pretend it, pretend that you're okay and eventually you'll be okay. Fake it till you make it. I definitely have family members who, there's someone in particular I call the queen of toxic positivity because they are just 
A plus at it. And I really I do think that made me believe that if I felt anything that wasn't happy, it was bad and that I could not express that. I just had to pretend I was okay. So I never got any help for any of those things that were navigatable that are that I now know to be they're not going to kill me. Your negative emotion isn't going to kill you, even though it can be so painful at times like it isn't going to do that. And I don't think I grasped that for a long time. No, for sure. And it's uh, like you said, toxic positivity. Just, I was bad for it for a long time. I really got to catch myself mm. nowadays when I am start acting like that because it's not cool and it's not good either as well. And I work with other, I've worked with other people over the years that are, I was like, there's no way you are like this every day. I, I'll say to myself. It's like, exhausting. Well, I was like, I don't know how you're like this every day. Oh, I am. There's no way you could be like this every day, man. So toxic positivity. You were saying that even you've been guilty of it. I think everybody has. And I don't think it comes from a bad place. Like it's good intentions. Like you want other people to feel good and to not think about the negative stuff. But it does cause it. It invalidates other people's experiences and feelings like man, my day was hard. Oh, don't say that. It could have been worse. This is all of those kind of statements are very invalidating, even though maybe the intention isn't bad. No, but it's, those are the types of things that need to stop though, as well. Like you said, just be there, be compassionate, be empathetic. Sometimes it's just nice that they just want you to listen to them. You don't need to say anything to them. Yeah. They just want you to listen and just let them know that everything's going to be okay. That's all you got to say. There's a great illustration that I once saw comparing empathy and sympathy, distinguishing between the two. And it was, there's, there are two people, one of them's in a hole, other person's on top of that hole looking down, be like, wow, sucks to be in that hole. Can't imagine, but I'm sorry that you're in the hole. And that's the sympathy. And then there's the other version, which is empathy, where that person is in the hole with you. I know how it is to be in this hole. I get it. And I'm not going to say, well, you need to get yourself out of the hole or what'd you do to end up here? Those sort of judgmental statements. It's being with you, like you just said, just the simple act of saying, I'm here. I, I hear you. Maybe I don't get it. Maybe I haven't been in this exact same situation, but I can imagine how difficult it is for you. And it's all about really the way that we word these things. But I just found that I, when I saw it, it really put that in perspective for me. I think, I, I don't know if I saw you had posted it or someone else, but I did remember, I recall seeing that in the last couple of weeks though. Okay. Recently. Yeah. yeah. Good one. Exact same little illustration though. Mm -hmm. of the one guy. Figures in a hole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. No, it's accurate. <laughs> For sure. So what of your deep inner longings have you been ignoring lately, Carmen? Oh my goodness. I love to perform. I have been a musician all my life. And oh, nice. What kind of music do you play? Or what do you I like doing? Of everything. I'm a little eclectic. Music is just great. It, I love it. It gives me life. It is the thing that makes me happiest. And I grew up playing violin. Mom's a pianist by profession. I didn't want to play piano, but I did end up on the violin. We'd play a lot together growing up. And I played throughout college as well and orchestras, things like that. And Indeed. yeah, I enjoyed it a lot, but I grew out of it after a bit. It's intense. The violin is a very specific instrument and I just, it's... Now, do you feel you'll get back into it or do you want to get back into it just to give you that little light that little joy in life again thing bring that yeah. back to you what happened was i ended up teaching myself to play the ukulele actually actually my I... daughter takes lessons right now she's just yeah she's in her second 10 week se Heck session again yeah. she loves she goes every monday it's amazing yeah. she loves it oh my it. gosh i adore the ukulele i think it is the most precious little instrument so mobile so convenient and you can sing with it and that's what i love singing won't claim to be the best singer in the world, but I grew up doing plays and acting and a lot of that was musical theater. And I love singing. And it always made me sad that 
with the violin because you're holding the instrument with your neck. You cannot sing and play the violin. That's just not feasible. So with the ukulele, it opened up this door for me to be like, I can make music, which I love. And also I can make it with my mouth too. <laughs> like it's so during quarantine, that was kind of one of my new activities. I got myself a $40 ukulele off Amazon, ordered it and just learned how to play. And I've been playing since then. So about two years. And it's a very simple instrument to pick up it though is. too. Yeah. How's yeah. it? How's your daughter like it so far? She loves it. She's okay. got a couple songs down pat and she, mm -hmm. they do little performances and stuff. Yes. It's coming up to the end and then it'll start again in the fall, but she really likes it. It gives her something to do that sense of no purpose to go out with other kids once a week. And she's made some friends there as well. Mm -hmm. It's nice for the kids. SpongeBob is, is the hit right now. SpongeBob SquarePants <laughs> song. So on the ukulele. Yes. Oh, that's pre. I love that. I would, yes. I would love to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like going to say, I think playing music is also a great way to teach mindfulness to kids and also a great way for anyone to practice it because you are really focused. You're in that flow state sometimes where if it's not too difficult and it's not too boring, you find yourself in that good middle ground of flow. And I, I think music helped me a lot to manage between music and running for me as throughout my like childhood and adolescence, those things like saved me, helped me a lot with my mental health without even knowing that it was doing, but I'll actually be put uh, involving music a bit more in my life. I'm, I try to post videos on Instagram sometime of playing little reels and I'm going to an open mic tomorrow. It's going to be the first one I've done in a long time. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Actually playing some jams by good old Canadian singer Avril Lavigne. Love her. <laughs> The theme, my theme that I gave myself was early 2000s pop punk. There you go. That's like, I, I love it. It reminds me of, I was going to say middle school, but that makes it sound like I liked middle school. It reminds me of how I survived middle school more accurately. And yeah, I'm going to play some jams tomorrow. Well, that's amazing. And it's nice to bring that music back into your life. And just bring that around again. I, I love music as well. I don't play any instruments, but podcasting or just listening to music. I love listening to yeah. music, all types of music. I love just sitting down and just almost just melting away sometimes and just listening to the words and the stories mm -hmm. that are behind the songs and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Listen to some things on repeat over and over again while I'm by myself and just to pick apart the song and it's a pretty cool story this guy's telling or whatever it is. Yeah, I think it can take you out of your day to day you know what it reminds me of have you seen the show ozark by any chance i've watched i haven't watched the full thing but i know which show you're talking about yeah i just finished it up recently and there's a character ruth langmore who listens to like old school rap all the time and that's my kind of gal yeah she's a very cool lady and i just i love the, the way that the directors like included this little trait of hers how whenever she's going to and from her money laundering drug heist whatever very dangerous activity she's partaking in she'll be jamming to some biggie and tupac and just going at it and really into it and i remember thinking i'm like that's how that's something that helps her i think get through all of this like her family's dying and being killed and it's a terrible story for her in the end but she uses music in that way that i so identify with and i think a lot of people can is that it, it people say it saves you so music definitely is therapy and even yeah. there's some musicians that help me get through some dark times that have been through the same things i've been through so it's nice to hear people sing about these things and just re you can relate to them as totally. well it's nice when you can relate to someone's music yeah like it reminds me of being in group therapy, for example, just that relatability of hearing anyone else say me too. The one of the worst parts of mental illness is that feeling of isolation, that you are in the depths of hell, and you're the only one down there. Everyone else is achieving is happy is thriving. And what's wrong with you and being able to hear you know 
feelings and thoughts that you share in music or poetry or a book or from somebody you know, or even in a group therapy se setting, I think can be really impactful. It's helped me a lot being, I think it's been one of the most impactful things being in a group setting for me. You find group therapy better than just one-on-one -on -one therapy with a therapist? Not better necessarily, but different. It has different benefits. There are a lot of things, a lot of maybe topics that you'll feel more comfortable diving into with an individual therapist, whereas coming up with like some tips for how to handle these situations, or like I said, having that just commonality of the human experience that you would get in a group setting and be like, hey, I tried this. Like I also deal with this issue and I do, I meditate for it, or I have this really cool coping mechanism that maybe you hadn't thought of being able to share that. It depends. I think they both have their advantages. For sure. No, it's good to try everything out and then you know right. what works and what doesn't at the end of the day, for sure. There's something called music therapy too. I don't know if you've ever taken part there's, in it. There's probably a therapy for everything out there. Yeah. It can be a bit <laughs> ridiculous. Say like It's like a little kumbaya around the yeah. campfire. Like, well, like what about goat yoga? Have you done goat yoga though? No, I haven't. I've seen people doing it though. Oh, I've done goat yoga. It's a good time. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And you pay way too much for a goat to jump on you. Basically, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they're so cute. Oh my gosh. One of my favorite things <laughs> when I'm sad is to look at baby goats in pajamas. I nice. highly recommend it the next time you're. We usually watch funny cat videos. Those are good too. Yes, my, they're yeah. ridiculous, some of them. Honestly, I have like paper written out of things that my mom can do to help me when I'm like not able to help myself Delio. And one of those things is to look up on YouTube, funny animal videos uh, and just sit me in front of the computer and make me watch the, and it's so effective. Honestly. It is. It yeah. just calms you down for whatever reason. It just brings this calming feeling over you. And it's amazing. It takes you out of whatever nonsense you're like ruminating about or whatever. Yeah. You're like, ah, but the cat <laughs> jumped and missed and it's so funny. <laughs> Uh huh. So, how big, though, a little bit more on a serious note, how big is the mental health problem among children and young adults today? I will say that I think it's getting a lot more. It's there's building awareness, right? There is more of a discussion on a national and global level about how impactful mental health is and how bad mental illness really is. I think that people are maybe feeling more comfortable about opening up even via platforms like, like TikTok or Instagram. Or, I don't know if it's just the people I follow or what like TikTok decides to show me, but people talking about maybe it's the level of anonymity. I'm not sure that makes people feel comfortable talking about their struggles. But so on that, on one side, there is maybe the stigma is decreasing a bit. I would like to hope that's the direction that we're headed in as like a society. But then on the other hand, there well, are- I don't feel yeah. there should be even be a stigma though either. Like there, yeah, there, there, there shouldn't be anything. Like you, sh it should be okay to struggle with what everyone's struggling with. There mm -hmm. shouldn't be a stigma around any of it. There really shouldn't be. No, I completely agree. I think it's ridiculous, but- like I also acknowledge like where we came from with the only discussion about mental illness being women who were hysterical and then locked up from that era of <laughs> mental health care in quotes to where we are now. I think it's come some way and we have so much more work to do when it comes to decreasing that stigma. Yeah, for sure. And I don't disagree with you at all there. There needs to be more talks. The things we're doing today, just having this talk as well, helps someone out there. It, it, it's nice so. to see people opening up more and I see much more of it going on, which is nice to see. So I, I, and I just encourage everyone out there listening or watching, have those talks with your friends, reach out to your friends, check in on your loved ones, your friends as well, your kids even. I try and make it a case, especially my daughter doesn't have a phone, she's too young. 
my son hey good morning logan good night logan just to say i love you like he's growing up he's a teenager i see him when he comes and that's okay but just have that connection and just reach out check in on your friends like i said again i'll repeat that one over and over again it's important to check in on your people or just Thanks. random people check out ask someone how they're doing when you're walking when you walk by them smile Man, if we all smiled at each other more and said hello and things like that, the world would be a different place. I think, it's, sure. I think it's important. Yeah, checking in on each other is so vital. And especially because of the isolation that a lot of us have felt in the past like two over two years now with the pandemic. It's like, to answer your question before, it's like, I do think that has caused a lot more issues, especially with everyone, but for school age children, or people getting their university years interrupted and totally altered. Many more people I've seen try the highest number of divorces through this whole thing too. Like, just yeah, people they're... being with one another 24 seven, especially when we're locked down or those types mm -hmm. of things. You know what I mean? Like, you do need that separate time apart from your loved ones even to go do your own thing. But when you can't even go out and do anything, it was hard on a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Lots of suicides, lots of suicide attempts, lots of overdoses, just things skyrocketed like no tomorrow. Yeah, a lot of substance abuse. I saw a post about that, how a lot of people got through it because they were able to like use substances as a crutch or they found their usage increasing during the pandemic. And it was like a call to reevaluate just what role now that maybe things aren't as bad, at least in terms of quarantining, reevaluating everything. Yeah. hundred percent. We just got to take care of everyone else out there. Take care of yourself first for yeah. most everyone <laughs> and then you can worry you know about everyone else but make sure you're taking care of that yourself you're mentally physically before you go giving yourself to everyone else stop the people mm. pleasing and worry about you the it's, self it's, not, it's not being selfish to take care of yourself first oh you have to put on your oxygen mask before you can help anybody else and as somebody who is passionate about helping others with the things I've struggled with. I think for so long, I felt guilty for not being able to help more. Like I felt like I had all of this, these tools and things, but I really did need to help myself first. Like I couldn't just be neglecting me and putting all my energy into just helping others in any way I could um, without showing that kind of love to yourself first and foremost. Yeah. For sure. I appreciate that for just chiming in on that. I think it's important to have those conversations. So what grounds you, Carmen, when you mm -hmm. have to make a tough decision? I find a lot of uh, peace literally in, in the ground and going outside and reconnecting with what I feel is my source of spirituality, of connection with a higher power, I find that in nature and being reconnected with it. So whenever I have a hard decision to make, or I struggle with making decisions, actually, that's something that I don't know, I laugh because I'm not sure if I still do per se, but I change my mind a lot. I'm like, I've been very unsure of myself, me and my intuition have been cut off from one another for a long time. I think that's one of the side effects of a variety of things. But I think a lot of us question, do we really know what's best? Do we really know what's best for ourselves to make decisions for others, for our children, for our loved ones? How am I supposed to know what's best? And we do get disconnected from our intuition. Something that helps me personally, and it can be different for everyone, but I find a lot of... Uh, grounding in being in nature and reconnecting with my breath while I'm out there really trying to get out of my head and into my body whatever that means that can be through the practice of yoga or mindfulness meditation walking using the five senses is a great one there's a technique that 
and this isn't so much for decision. I think it could be. It's called 54321. I'm not sure if you've maybe heard of it, but it's about identifying the different senses around you. So getting out of your head and getting into your body to list, you start with a five, five things, list five things you can see. I see my pink water bottle and I see the green plant and I always end up doing colors because that's helpful for me. But then you go down to four. What are four things you can touch? What are three things that you can hear? What are two things you can smell? What's one thing you can taste? And through that, I find a lot of grounding and able to- I've heard of that and I've had that like pre- taught to me or tried the people the therapist to get me to do those types of things too. And, yeah. and, and I see why it would work and for some, maybe not for others, but yeah, for- but that would definitely get your mind off whatever you're ruminating about or whatever, wherever your mm-hmm. mind was at the time, just to calm you down too. Sure. And there's so many different ways to do that. And I think it's an adventure. It's an exploration to- look at all the tools out there that exist and go create your own toolbox. Pick the ones that work for you. For sure. We've come to the end of the show today, Carmen. I truly appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come on and share your mental health journey and just your journey in general. And I wish you all the best. But before we go, where can everyone find you on Instagram or TikTok, wherever you are? What, where sure. can they find you? What are those handles? On Instagram, I'm Carmen Sita, which is my first name, Carmen, and then C-I-T-A. So C-A-R-M-E-N-C-I-T-A underscore S-G. Not Mama Sita, everyone. Not Mama Sita, Carmen Sita. So fun <laughs> fact, the little Ita in Spanish is just like the little Something like a mama Cita is like a little mommy, right? <laughs> <laughs> and Carmen Cita was my nickname as a kid. So <laughs> Carmen Cita underscore SG on TikTok. I am Carmen Panda Girl, which was my first email as a kid. So <laughs> that is how you can find me. Thank you again for coming yeah. on the show today and sharing my your pleasure. story. Absolutely. Really Thank enjoyed you having you. Thank you very much for having me. It was great talking. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day, Carmen. Alrighty, you too. Take care. Thank you.